Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Welcome to the latest in our series of uh, Friday forecasting talks, and we're really pleased to be welcoming um, Paul Goodwin and Stefan Kalassa, who will uh, be our discussants today. Uh, so welcome to Paul and Stefan. Um, just before we get into their presentation, I'm just going to hopefully share my screen and just give you a very brief. All right, I uh, hope you can see my screen now. And uh, hopefully you can see the title of today's talk, which is when and what not to forecast. So I'm sure that will be a fascinating topic. I just want to say a little bit about our centre here at Lancaster University. Um, you can see pictures of our members there. Um, and you can also see on the left some of the things that we're doing. Uh, we offer bespoke short courses to industry and also consultancy. Next summer will be an opportunity for uh, projects linked into an MSc student. We've also advised on software development. Um, we currently have a noise transfer partnership with a major automotive manufacturer and there could be opportunities for more. And also through our um, statistics and operational research with industry partnership, we also partner with companies for PhD research projects as well. So quite a lot of things going on. Um, we haven't had a in-person uh, gathering in London for some time, but we are hoping to do that next year. So we'll keep you posted about that. And probably most of you know our areas of expertise. They're listed on the right there. And um, obviously our FFTs, forecasting, uh, Friday forecasting talks, have followed these uh, subjects. Just a little bit about keeping up to date with us quite a lot of different ways. Um, we are active on Twitter and LinkedIn. You can just email us directly and we'll get back to you. You can see what we're doing on our website. And also we're quite excited about what we're doing in YouTube at the moment. Just yesterday, we released a short um, video introducing the centre and there's going to be some educational videos to come as well. So uh, please look out for those. Uh, and finally, of course, you know about Friday Forecasting Talks because you're here with us today. OK, so um, that's enough from me just to give you that little intro to our Centre for Market Analytics and Forecasting. I'm going to come out of this now. Uh, just give me a moment and I'm going to stop sharing. OK, great. Well, um, it's time now for me to hand over to our first speaker, uh, Professor Paul Goodwin, and he will talk uh, for 10 to 15 minutes, giving his views on on this subject. So I'll turn my camera off and hand over to you, Paul. OK, uh, can you see my slides OK? Uh, yes. OK, that's good. Well, thank you very much, uh, John, uh, uh, for inviting me to uh, give this talk and to discuss this uh, important topic, uh, when and uh, when not to forecast. First of all, it would be useful to look at some motives why people make forecasts. And I'll let the you and the audience consider whether these are justifiable reasons for forecasting. I think the most obvious reason for forecasting is to support decision making. Uh, should we develop or cancel a proposed new product? We need forecasts to tell us that. H how much stock should we hold? How many schools or hospitals will we need in 10 years time? I, I think a clear and justifiable motive for forecasting in most circumstances. Another reason is to uh, scare people into action. Uh, extrapolations of global temperatures or sea levels up to 2050 will hopefully scare people into taking the problem seriously and scare governments into taking action. Or within a company, uh, forecasts of impending bankruptcy might uh, scare people into doing something about it so that they uh, save their company from administration and, uh, and bankruptcy. But there are other motives for forecasting as well. Some forecasts, I'm sure, are there so people can make a name for themselves, uh, particularly if you're selling forecasts. Um, there's a phenomenon called broken clock forecasting. Uh, a broken clock, of course, is, uh, twice, uh, is correct twice a day. And there's an analyst who I won't name in America who every year says there'll be a recession this year without fail he always forecasts the recession. And of course, occasionally he's right. And he relies on the fact that people will remember his correct forecasts and forget all the times he got it wrong. 
and that he'll therefore be regarded as a person with uh, special insights, a, a guru, if you like, somebody who will uh, uh, produce uh, quite amazingly accurate forecasts. Um, I think uh, this effect where we remember remarkably accurate forecasts, but forget all the times they were wrong, is, co is called the Gene Dixon effect after a famous uh, um, fortune teller who correctly uh, predicted the assassination of President Kennedy, but made lots of other forecasts that uh, didn't come true. The reason, is, I think, is to shift responsibility for a difficult or impossible decision. Uh, it's known that uh, US judges have a very difficult decision when people come before them who are suffering from various conditions and they have to decide whether these people present a risk to the public and, and should therefore be, uh, be um, kept in confinement or whether they are safe enough to be released. So they often rely on of how those people will behave if they're released. All the analysis suggests that these forecasts are totally inaccurate. You may as well toss a coin or draw a card from a, from a pack of cards to, to make the forecast. But for the judges, it serves the purpose that they can blame somebody else uh, if, uh, if they make a mistake in their decision. Forecasting also reduces the discomfort of nagging uncertainties. Uh, when will the Ukraine war end? Uh, will it rain when I'm on holiday? Uh, so possibly it serves a useful purpose there. But of course, we may be uh, wrongly informed about the uncertainties, uh, in which case, of course, it's clearly uh, clearly not useful. Uh, forecasting for curiosity. When will the first humans land on Mars? Uh, when will a cure for aging be found? I'd like to know that. Uh, uh, Sir John um, uh, Curtis, who the famous sophologist in Britain, um, confessed to me when I was talking to him that his exit polls, which forecast how people are, uh, are voted in an election, are really for entertainment, that they're actually a form of now casting, of course, because people have already voted. But he confessed it's really a form of entertainment uh, to keep uh, people talking while the true results come through. So I think they serve the purpose of uh, curiosity when we can't wait for the results. Forecasts are also used to meet legal requirements of regulators. Banks in the USA have to submit forecasts and their process of producing those forecasts is examined uh, to, to see if they meet legal requirements. And finally, when we did interviews with forecasters recently, a forecaster from a major software company, one of the biggest software companies in the world, said that the forecasting served the purpose of team building, of making uh, forecast, uh, forecasters uh, learn together uh, and uh, share objectives. It, it led to the creation of a working team. They weren't too bothered about accuracy. It was the process of forecasting that brought the, brought the benefits. So I think some of those motives are justified as others are not. So I think there are four situations. Four, well, there are situations where forecasting is clearly useful. There are situations I'll talk about in a second where it probably isn't useful. There are situations where forecasting per se is useful but the way it's done can be damaging. So you probably shouldn't be making forecasts in that way. And finally, uh, forecasting may be useful, but in certain circumstances, it carries risks if we're not careful. So what constitutes a useful forecast? Well, a forecast should be tailored to a decision. If it's intended to support a decision, it should be tailored to that decision and likely to improve it. Otherwise, there's no point in forecasting. It should be honest, trusted and reliable. It should be free of political bias and wishful thinking. Its rationale, assumptions and limitations should ideally be understood and accepted by decision makers. And it should make appropriate use of available information and expert knowledge subject to cost effectiveness. If the cost of forecasting uh, exceeds the benefits of forecasting, then clearly forecasting isn't justifiable. So arguably, you shouldn't be forecasting if you can't meet those conditions. We should not forecast uh, if those conditions are violated. What about the second thing? When might forecasts not be useful? Well, we're all, I'm sure, aware of Knight's distinction between risk, where you can assess probabilities of outcomes, and uncertainty, where you don't know all the possible outcomes, and we can't put probabilities on them. This may be the case where we're planning transportation systems 40 years ahead or ensuring water supplies up to 2050. So many things can happen over that period. We can't put probabilities on the different outcomes. So in this case, perhaps we should consider alternatives to forecasting. Scenario planning, for example, is where we identify a range of alternative plausible futures. 
but we don't put probabilities on them. And we simply aim for robust options that should help us to survive and hopefully prosper at whatever the future throws at us. Of course, you may argue that scenario planning is a form of forecasting and that we're, we're forecasting the bounds of what might happen. But let's go a stage further inspect and say, we don't know what will happen. We genuinely do not know, have no idea what's going to happen in the future. Well, perhaps then we should be using Talib's notion of anti-fragility. We should use flexibility so that we can cope with alternative futures, get out clauses. We should build redundancy into systems. And we should make only small incremental improvements on the lines of Lindbaum's famous muddling through. In other words, we don't know what's going to happen, so we ensure that we are, in Taleb's terms, anti-fragile. We can cope with the lots of alternative futures. Problem, of course, is when a forecaster pretends to know when they can't know. James Lovelock, the famous uh, scientist who invented the concept of Gaia, uh, once said, I'm in relation to climate forecasting, I'm proud to be part of a nation whose climate scientists have the courage in 2013 simply to say, we don't know. If we don't know, we should say we don't know. We shouldn't pretend we can forecast. The third condition I mentioned is where the manner of the forecasting renders it potentially damaging, where a forecast is likely to be misleading, perhaps due to poor practice or judgmental biases or deliberate manipulation. We shouldn't forecast under those conditions. We should be careful that the forecast isn't misunderstood. For example, a, a forecast might give a false impression that there's little or no uncertainty or risk. Uh, point forecasts are particularly a danger there. And also perhaps forecasting in the arts. There are companies like, and I can never pronounce the name, Epogagix, I think it's a Greek term, who use algorithmic forecastings of the sex success of music or films. But might they ensure that brilliant, creative, but unconventional work never sees the light of day? Should we be using algorithms to forecast the arts? It's debatable. The final condition that I mentioned is where I'm not clear whether we should forecast. Forecasting can bring benefits, perhaps, but also it should be done with risks, uh, with, with a, an awareness of the risks. A case like this is where forecasts interact with outcomes. I'm old enough to remember the 1970 general election in Britain, where Harold Wilson, who's pictured on the right there, was predicted by the opinion polls to have a walkover victory over Edward Heath, his uh, opposition uh, opponent. Uh, the, the, the polls said it was going to be an easy victory. It's a nice sunny day in June. People thought, well, Wilson's going to get in anyway. I'm not going to bother voting. And uh, surprise, surprise, the forecast was wrong. Uh, Edward Heath, his opponent, won. So where forecasts are almost self-destructive, because by making a forecast, we change behaviour to mean that forecast will be wrong. Perhaps we should reconsider whether we should be forecasting. For, for accuracy, it's, if, if accuracy is our objective, it's best to forecast when the forecast, the thing we're forecasting is independent of the forecast. A forecast of Halley's Comet, for example, returning in 2061 would change its outcome, nor probably will internal forecasts of sales. Uh, influence potential purchases. Similar to that are self-fulfilling prophecies. And this can pose dangers as well. For example, forecasts of crime hotspots may lead to overzealous policing, alienation, and hence more crime. Um, so the act of forecasting makes the situation we're trying to control uh, worse. But where forecasts influence outcomes in other ways, I mentioned the forecast of bankruptcy at the start, leading people to take steps to avoid it, or dire climate extrapolations causing us to change our behaviour to mitigate those dangers. I think forecasting is, is justified. Finally, there are situations where do we really want to know about the future? Take forecasts of whether you'll develop a disease. There's a horrible condition called Huntington's disease. It's, it's an inherited condition. And I think anybody whose parents have had it has a 50-50 chance of developing the disease. But there is a test now which will tell you with certainty whether you will have the disease in, in the future. Well, in a survey of people who had the opportunity to take that test, only 5 to 10% of people in the USA uh, were prepared to take the test. They didn't want to know. Isn't the act of uh, making the forecast is if it makes you unhappy if you if it ruins your life knowing that you're certain to develop the disease 
is it worth making those forecasts? So those are some ideas about when and when you shouldn't forecast. Thank you very much. OK, thank you, Paul. Thank you very much for those thoughts. Uh, and also thank you very much for keeping to time as well. Uh, excellently timed. Um, so now I can hand over to our next speaker. Um, after we've heard both talks, then we'll move into some discussion. So it's time now to hand over to Dr. Stefan Colasa. Wonderful. Thank you very much, John. Uh, I hope you can see my screen. I'm trying to. Okay, I yes, we can. The... Yes. We Wonderful. Can. Okay, beautiful. So thank you very much for this opportunity to pontificate. Uh, um, I like this topic when and what not to forecast. I liked it very much, but honestly, I thought about it and thought about it. And to ask a forecaster what not to forecast is uh, kind of like asking a politician what to, what not to tax. So I, I, I for, for, for the life of it, I, I couldn't Find, come up with something, and I'll, uh, I'm I'm happy that Paul just told us everything where we shouldn't be forecasting, and we'll have a nice discussion afterwards. Where uh, I, I took some notes. All right. So, but uh, since I couldn't come up with anything, I'm I'm sure you all will be getting your money back. So just go and ask even about that. But uh, just so that we don't have uh, too much free time, I thought I'd not talk about what not to forecast, but about when to be careful about forecasting, which I think ties nicely into Paul's point three, but we'll have that discussion later on. So I'd just like to put something on your desk uh, that just came across my desk in the last couple of weeks, and which is this here. So um, this is a forecasting talk, so I thought we should see at least a few time series. And um, Paul was sadly remiss about that, so I'll uh, take up the slack. So here's a time series. Actually, it's four time series. What is this? This is sales, daily sales of one particular stock keeping unit in four different retail locations. And uh, please especially note the vertical axes. So you have lots of zeros and a couple of humongous spikes. There is no other word to describe these. It goes up to 3000 and sometimes it's zero. Uh, I'm not going to ask you what this is. I'm going to tell you in a second. Uh, for now, here's a little uh, table, a very rudimentary table of this third time series. We have 911 days with zero sales, three days, uh, no, what, uh, three days with one sale or one unit sold up to one day with 1,321 units sold. Beautiful. So um, as I said, it's the same stock keeping unit in all in four different locations. What is this? What is this mystery product? Uh, these are roof tiles. These are the kinds of things. <laughs> Just saw the, the chat. <laughs> masks for COVID. No, masks for COVID don't have this kind of spiky behavior. I think they're selling like uh, on a high level. They've been selling for a couple of years now. <laughs> okay, beautiful. These are roof tiles. That's the kind of thing that you put on your roof, essentially. And it makes perfect sense for these to show this kind of behavior. Uh, because when do you need roof tiles? You need roof tiles when you build a new house or when you redo your roof. And then you don't just need one or two or 20, then you need hundreds of them. And actually, many of these sales um, I hear from the retailer, if, which is a do-it-yourself store or home improvement store, many of these sales actually do not occur to end customers, to the people who actually live in the house and build their own house. But many of these sales are to contractors, to companies that roof your house. And they'll, of course, come in with their uh, lorry or truck and pick up enough tiles to last for five or 10 houses. And then, well, they need 3,000 roof tiles. Actually, I don't know how many you need to roof a typical house. Uh, I could have tried to find out, I didn't. All right, so the question really is, um, what's a good forecast for these time series? And actually, when you start thinking about that, uh, it's a bit of a rabbit hole. Now, this is where I think you need to be really careful about forecasting. Because what's the problem here? This depends hugely on logistics and processes, what a good forecast is. We can either say we want these, we want these tiles to be on stock so people can come in and pick them up. 
even if they come in with their truck and pick up enough for to last for uh, for like multiple houses at a time. We want these products to be on stock. Then you need a different forecast than if you say we just want a couple of units there so people can look at them and place an order if they want more, if they actually want to roof their house. And of course, uh, if you really want 3000 units on hand for this bottom time series down here, uh, this is not just one stock keeping unit. This particular home improvement retailer has multiple roof tiles and they have multiple other building materials too. And if you want enough of all of these building materials on hand to satisfy these sorts of lumpy demands, uh, then you need a lot of space and a lot of working capital. So essentially, my understanding is that most products are sold, at least in this category, in these building materials categories, are sold by customer orders. So people have to call in ahead of time and say, I'm going to come in next Wednesday and pick up 3000 tiles of this particular stock keeping unit. Please have them on hand. And then the store manager will say, wonderful. The manager will place an order at the distribution center and the distribution center will push the product to the store or directly to the customer and it'll be charged or credited to this particular store. So the key issue here is that we can't assess whether a forecast is good or bad without understanding what process it is, support, is supposed to support, what process we needs the forecast and what the forecast is, being, is going to be used for. All right. Where's my mouse pointer? Here we go. OK, so one way that things can go wrong in this particular situation with these um, with these customer orders and roof tiles, of course, it's uh, pretty simple to actually detect the customer orders. We can just say, OK, anything down here, any the noise down there, that's just people coming in buying tiles to repair their roof. Uh, that can happen and maybe you want five or ten tiles just to repair a hole or perhaps there's been a hailstorm or something like that. No problem. And anything above that we can easily detect as look, there's somebody, something lumpy happening here. So it's easy to detect these historical customer orders, these lumpy orders. It's easy. Now we can use these and feed these as predictors into our forecasting solution. There's no problem. We can do that. That's easy. Probably wouldn't be doing a REMA or exponential smoothing. You'd do something causal, but it's simple. It's easy. And OK, now we've got that. Now we've built our model and now we can start forecasting. And here's a little bifurcation happening. So on the one hand, we do short term forecasting for store replenishment. How much product do I have to order today from the store? to be delivered from the DC to the store. And if I'm ordering today, then I probably already have customer orders for the next week or so. All the contractors who are going to come in and pick up tiles, they've already called in and told me that they're going to do that. And if nobody called me, then I'm probably not going to have any customer orders. So my forecast will be fine here. It's going to be low if nobody calls in. It's going to be high if somebody's called in and I'll have enough product on hand. Everything's going to be fine. Beautiful. However, going back one step to the distribution center or even higher to the entire country or the entire chain, there is a retailer who has these hundreds of stores across the entire country and uh, they need to source their tiles multiple months in advance. And the problem is you don't know the customer orders multiple months in advance. You only know them about a week in advance because nobody tells you I'm going to come in in three months to pick up the tiles. People call in a week ahead of time. So when today you do a forecast for the next three months and you don't have these predictors because you don't know the customer orders, your forecast is going to be far too low. And that's regardless of whether you use the predictors on the DC level or you forecast on a store level and don't have the predictors farther out into the future and aggregate these forecasts up, or whether you do some kind of optimal combination approach. In any case, you're going to have forecasts that are too low if you use these predictor approaches. So what this turns into is a situation where the forecasts on the DC level, on the distribution center level, on the aggregate level, they have to be higher than the sum of the forecasts on the bottom level. And that's this sum coherence has in recent times 
been the holy grail of hierarchical forecasting. And in this particular case, it's not going to be a useful way to support our decision making. So we really need to think about our forecasts and this simple approach of having coherent hierarchical forecasts can lead us badly astray here. All right, a couple of takeaways. Forecasting always presupposes certain conditions or contexts, and that's one more thing that we're going to talk about uh, later on about Paul's presentation. Here, the context is what processes do our forecasts support? What information is available? Do we know about the customer orders? When do we know about them? If the forecaster just blindly tries to optimize their forecast based on some kind of accuracy metric, uh, then the end result may not be what the end user needs. If you have your lumpy demands and you want to forecast that and you don't know when they're going to come in, the best you're going to do is like a mean forecast, an expectation that is too high for the baseline demand and far too low for the lumpy demands. So that's not going to make anybody happy. Or if you remove the peaks, then you'll have nice forecast for the baseline, but you'll not be able to capture these peaks unless you treat them separately. And treating the peaks separately, as I said, runs afoul of the problem that you don't have the information far enough in advance that you need. So the conclusion is really that the forecaster really needs to have some understanding, some notion of the processes that consume their forecasts, and uh, because otherwise things can go badly wrong. And um, I'll close with this little four way Venn diagram that I posted a couple of years back on data science about uh, what the perfect data scientists should have as characteristics. They should understand statistics, they should understand programming, they should understand business, and they should be have enough understanding of communication to communicate these issues and these horrendous little details to the people whose responsibility it is to yeah, make sense of them. All right, I think I've stayed in my time more or less too. So thank you very much, John. Back to you. Oh, beautiful unicorn. <laughs> Spiras, you're doing a great job there. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Stefan. And uh, very nice that we had two um, presentations giving really quite different perspectives, but also there is a little bit of overlap as you as you mentioned. So um, I think in the next phase, I'm going to invite first of all maybe Paul to make some comments or ask some questions of Stefan, and then we'll do it the opposite way around, and Stefan can make some comments or ask questions of Paul. And um, yeah, and we'll see how we go. And then when all that's done, um, I may even have one or two questions myself, and then we'll. Um, Make it open to everybody else to ask questions. So maybe I'll start with you, Paul. Is there any comments uh, well, or questions you'd like to ask of Stefan? Uh, yeah, well, th thanks for your presentation, uh, Stefan. Yeah, I think that um, if we're talking about Venn diagrams, we do overlap on your key point, which is that forecasters must have under some understanding of the rationale underlying their forecasts. Um, and I think that that can be a problem with uh, with AI methods and so on, which which uh, have an explainability problem. Uh, I th so I think uh, all I can do is agree on your key your key takeaway. Basically, uh, we obviously overlap there, but uh, uh, some of your comments before suggest that uh, our Venn in Venn diagram terms, our sets might not totally overlap. Um, I, I, I sense that you felt that we should. Uh, there's always a case for forecasting, whereas of course I, although it took me a lot of scratching of my head, I admit, uh, given the title of the uh, of the session. Uh, I thought I had come up with some genuine cases where forecasting probably isn't advisable. OK, John, do you mind if I if I answer right no, away? No, please, straight away. Absolutely. Oh, very good, very good. Yeah, so um, Paul, thank you very much. Uh, yes, I agree. I think we're in mostly in agreement, although I, I may start talking about the explainability in AI later on. Yeah. And uh, to a degree, yes, I understand your point that forecasting can be dangerous. Uh, it's uh, fire and politics and forecasting, a powerful uh, tool and a dangerous master, really, or whatever the, the, the quote was. But honestly, I think uh, when I looked at your examples, uh, for instance, your, your slide two, where forecasting is not useful, um, I think 
what we're really doing is we're still forecasting. We're calling it something else, but we're still forecasting. If you say uh, we need scenario planning, then I am completely in agreement. But in just this, in deciding which scenarios you want to look at and which scenarios are simply unrealistic and we don't need to worry about them, that's a kind of forecasting. Even if we don't put a, 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 a probability on it, and I agree that it's going to be very hard to put a probability on the modes of transport in 40 years. But um, where I'm living, they just put in a, a new light rail line, and that was a major endeavor, it, lots of disruption, it was very expensive. And uh, the politicians who decided on where that light rail should go, they had to make some assumptions or decisions or scenarios or forecasts or whatever you want to call it, where people will be living in the next uh, 30 or 50 years, because that's the time frame they have to look at. And of course, everybody understands that they will not be able to have any a lot of precision about this forecast. but. On the other hand, uh, they have at least have to understand that uh, the city will grow in one direction and not in the other, because the other direction, that's the neighboring federal state of Germany, and they're simply not going to grow there. And in particular, they're not going to put a light rail line there because that's a completely different jurisdiction, uh, stuff like that. And then again, we have the exact same thing as you were talking about. The forecasts and the actions there uh, have an impact on what's going to happen because they are building the light rail line. So where are going to build the uh, people are going to build their houses? Well, where the light rail line is right now, because there's easier transport that way. So there is a feedback loop that's happening here. But I think uh, we're still forecasting and we're just uh, giving it a different name so it's it's actually very easy for me i call everything a forecast yes um of course the example you've just used is where the the forecast is almost self-fulfilling you build a railway uh, and that creates the need and people live there but there is the opposite situation where a, a forecast as soon as you make it it's bound to be wrong uh, the opinion poll example was the best i could think of there you make a forecast that changes people's behavior. Um, uh, this, of course, might be beneficial if I forecast you're going to go bankrupt. So you change your behavior and you don't go bankrupt. I suppose that, that can be beneficial, but I don't think it's beneficial in every case. On the scenarios, yeah, I did, I think, probably partly concede the point when I was talking that you might argue that scenarios, you are trying to forecast the bounds of possibilities and so on. But I did go a stage further and bring up Talib's anti-fragility concept, where you simply say, I don't know. You know, I, new technology is 50 years ahead are just totally unknown so what we have to do is build our systems with redundancy with flexibility with get out clauses uh, so we don't make a forecast we just basically make ourselves robust to ensure that what the hell happens in the future uh, we, we should be okay um, and I think there are some situations like that I think uh, I think long-term technological forecasting is, is is you know nobody foresaw the internet did they 50 years ago I don't know I think perhaps one or two people did but uh, they weren't very very uh, they weren't didn't get a lot of publicity and so on um, so I think sometimes and I think there's a danger as I say of pretending that we do know or thinking that we know uh, um, when when we don't, uh, and that I think can mislead decision makers. Uh, but I do take your point on scenario planning. I, I, I remember uh, debates between um, uh, George Wright, who's very much a proponent of scenario planning, and Michael Lawrence at many conferences. It's, they, they seem to have the same debate for, for years about whether prob whether scenarios are a form of forecasting. And I think it's it's right on the edge. They're not typical of forecasts. They're, they're narratives rather than numbers. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, I, I do take your point there. That is a debatable, uh, debatable one. Yeah. Yeah, now that you bring up the anti-fragility, that's actually another key point that I took down when I took my notes. Mm -hmm. uh, I think even the anti-fragility framework, which I completely subscribe to, it makes perfect sense. It is completely correct. Um, it's hard in the in the application, but even so, anti-fragility still presupposes some kinds of forecasts. There are some places in the world where you build your house to withstand the shocks of an earthquake. If you live in Japan, you build your house so it can withstand earthquakes up to a certain magnitude. Mm. At some point in time, it becomes economically infeasible to build houses that will withstand everything. So there is a trade off that you have to do in there. But in other places of the world where I live, we sometimes have slight tremors or shocks or whatever. But nobody cares about building a house that will withstand earthquakes. And if I asked my builder to do that, he'd be looking at me strange. 
yeah. and that makes perfect sense and and it doesn't make sense to build a house in the middle of germany that is anti-fragile with respect to earthquakes and there is your forecast we, everybody's forecasting there will not be major earthquakes mm -hmm. in the part of germany where i live mm -hmm. and that is a forecast and that nice. dictates what kinds of anti-fragility we need and where mm -hmm. we need to invest into robustness we need to invest in robustness in other cases and as i said nobody forecasted the internet you're completely right about that and if they ha and that was a bad forecast a bad forecast it was unforeseeable really but if people had known that, that something like that would have come along then newspapers and so on and so forth might have made different decisions uh, 40 years ago and made might have made themselves anti-fragile with respect to the internet but that's not a, a criticism of forecasting as such that's just a case where the forecasts were off and that's a, just a case of things happen that we didn't forecast and nobody's to blame for it because some things are just very hard to foresee or can only be foreseen by those broken clocks that you mentioned at the very beginning mm. so, yes the the, the, the issue of um, making yourself anti-fragile in housing terms and so on. The, the, the problem is that, that the, the forecasts can give us unwarranted confidence, I think. Um, for example, with climate change, the lots of examples of where we're told a, a, a thousand year or a hundred year flood has occurred, you know, four times in the last 20 years and so on. Um, so the problem is that people have, have, have um, built flood defences, uh, assuming that um, the forecast is right, that the flood would only occur once in 100 years and that they're occurring much more frequently. So uh, you could say it's, it's wrong forecasting, but the problem is that people give too much confidence, I think, to the forecast and um, make decisions accordingly. So your flood barriers aren't, can't cope for 100 years, they can only go for a few years before they're breached. So I think it's often forecasters can give the impression that their forecasts are more more accurate than they really are. And I think, I think that's a problem. So forecasting is a problem in that context. Um, but I, I quite clearly see that for any decision making about the future, you've got to have some sort of notion, I suppose, of, of, of what, what's going to happen. But whether that adds up to a forecast, if there's something we could dis discuss. Yeah. Yeah, when it comes to humility in forecasting, I think we're also on very much on the same page. Mm -hmm. And the problem is what kind of incentives govern forecasters. If you have two forecasters and one gives a smaller prediction intervals than the other one, then he's going to, he or she is going to look more competent yes, to yes. the consumer. And unfortunately, nobody looks back at the track record of forecasters and it's very hard to say, well, yeah, this person's been bad for the last 10 years. Does it mean they're yeah. going to be bad in the next 10 years or have things changed so much that they're going to be good in the future? Yes. Have they learned from it? So it's it's hard. And uh, the pressure really, the, the incentive structure for forecasters is against humility and against saying yes. we don't know yes uh, yes there's, there's an interesting study a few years ago where people were asked to choose between prediction intervals i think it was for the number of olympic medalists by one country and people preferred a narrower prediction interval which didn't include the act outcome to a wide one which did um, can, can i just come in on something here because i think it's interesting this question about humility isn't it because it's not just about what, whether we should not forecast. It's also what else we should be doing. So I'm, I'm, I'll give an example of something I've come across recently where uh, we're looking at longer term forecasts and the company recognised they need to improve their forecast for demand over the long term. We're talking five to ten years, that sort of horizon. Um, and that's fine, they do. But when I have challenged them to say, well, yes, but for what purpose, for what gain in terms of inventory service, they're not actually able to articulate what really they mean by that and some more fundamental questions and the, what prompted me was your comments Stefan about that you know uh, very 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 lumpy demand which should of course be bread and butter to me but anyway um, but that's what prompted it I'd just be interested in your thoughts on that so it's not saying not forecast but you need to do something else basically yeah I think you still need to do forecast if you're a company and then you you yeah. need your five to ten year forecasts for capacity planning in the future 
whether to build a new manufacturing plant. I come from retail, so a retailer will have very long range forecasts about the viability of a new supermarket or uh, the non viability of ex existing supermarkets uh, in order to think about closing one down. Mm -hmm. And there yeah. you do think about the next five or 10 years. Right. And uh, there the uh, the value is immediate. If you don't open a supermarket in a spot yeah. where it would be profitable, you forego money. And if you keep a supermarket open in a place where that is dying simply for some kind of demographical reasons, then you're going to lose money. So it's it's it, the relationship is is direct and, and immediate. And honestly, the the point is uh, the forecast needs to support a decision. That's what we've been talking about. And of course, decisions have a certain horizon, and then the forecast horizon must match that decision. Don't need a five-year forecast to for your replenishment, for your operational store okay. replenishment. And you de don't need a two-day horizon for your uh, strategic planning of whether to outsource production to China. So it, there needs to be a match there. Thanks, Stefan. Um, just before we move on to everybody else's questions, was there anything, Stefan, you particularly wanted to ask Paul, which you haven't already? Uh, you think I haven't uh, been 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 painful enough already? <laughs> Actually, no. I, mean, I just I just very very much uh, liked your your presentation. I think we're mostly on the same uh, on the same slide. Uh, yeah, yeah. Honestly, I've taken a couple of notes. Oh yeah, yes. You talked about explainable AI, but honest, uh, but I don't think we don't really have the time to go into that rabbit hole. Perhaps that's uh, best yes. left for yes. the next yes. Friday. Yes, it's a thing. It's useful that um, we did disagree on some things. It would might have been a fairly boring session if we both <laughs> if we both said you should always forecast. Well, so um, can, uh, don't worry, I, Paul. I, we, I, we can I, been, liven things up now with some some telling been, questions. I hope. Yes, I've been a deliberate devil's advocate given the given the title of the of the session. Yeah. Okay. Um, so just before we move into the next part, I, I just remind uh, those who are online that you can use the chat facility. Uh, I'm following it and so is Kandrika. Uh, if you wanted to ask any questions of <coughs> Paul and uh, Stefan and we do have a few questions already. So we'll I'll start off with an easy one. Uh, it's from Ivan. Um, can you please define the term forecast? Well, I think a forecast. I'll have a go first anyway. Stephen. Yes, probably please do. A better one, but <laughs> I think a genuine honest expectation of what will happen in the future based on the information you have available at the time of making that uh, that forecast um that can take several forms but i think that i think that's yeah. the essence of it that's the best i can do off the top of my yeah. head that's, that's very impressive paul um did you want to add anything to that uh Stephen? um i think i, I I, I'm not going to say that I take issue with the word, but I'd uh, I wouldn't use the word expect because that really ties into expectation forecasts and uh, quantile forecasts are so important. So, what I like most about forecasts is a probability distribution over potential future outcomes or states of the world, and the probability distribution can be very vague. It can be essentially we have these five different scenarios. We don't know which one's going to be more likely than the other. So we essentially implicitly put the same probability on all of them. But there's a few other things like uh, green men from Mars suddenly raining down on Earth that we can confidently rule out. So it's essentially, yeah, giving a set of potential outcomes for the future together with probabilities and excluding others. Well, oh, your answer actually gives me a nice segue into a related question uh, from Kandrika, which is, can we draw a boundary between forecasts and scenarios? Well, who'd like to have a go at that one? Paul. Well, this, of course, is what uh, Steph and I have just been uh, discussing. Uh, I mean, I mean, I mean, some people say that scenario the scenarios comes in various forms by the way they come in various forms the, the, the stuff i'm interested in is where you're trying to set the bounds the extremes of what can happen in the future uh, so that you can say whatever happens between those extremes you can you're going to cope with and, and hopefully prosper so 
the problem with, with scenarios is that they're detailed narratives and therefore in themselves have an infinitesimal probability of occurring, the sort of scenarios I'm talking about. Um, the probability of, of a given combination of events transpiring in the future is, 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 is pretty low. Um, so, um, so, 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 but you might argue that by estimating those bounds, we are in a sense producing a, a, a forecast albeit a non-quantitative uh, mm -hmm. forecast mm -hmm. um so i think i think i think that's debatable uh, you know whether uh, whether scenario is a forecast or not i think it, we can argue that for, for quite a soon time mm -hmm. okay you want to add anything uh, uh, Stefan? uh well Chad? i like the the distinction that paul drew uh, before very much that a scenario is um, forecasts are have numbers and scenarios have narratives sure. that's a very mm -hmm. simple distinction yeah. and of course the boundaries are are vague and floating and it's it's yeah. hard to say yeah, yeah, the yeah. scenarios start here and the forecasts stop there but i think that's a very that's a very useful first guideline John, I, I can't contain myself that's Go on, Robert. Usual, of course <laughs> um, and, and paul's been unduly modest uh and that's not unusual either, um, <laughs> it not, not referring to a discussion of this exact issue in George Wright's Scenarios Journal, whose title escapes me, of which Paul and I contributed, uh, trying to draw some distinctions, which I think we broadly did. I mean, it's clear that scenarios have elements, uh, fore forecast elements to it, demographics being an obvious example of pretty well every scenario. Uh, but nevertheless, and I've said this in the chat, there is a clear difference of emphasis. Uh, and I'm talking about scenario um, proponents here, protagonists, who would emphasize not the ranking, not the probabilistic uh, estimate at all, uh, but uh, describe it as a process. I personally don't think that's good enough. Again, I suggest having a look at the discussion uh, George Wright's journal, because it is a very controversial subject um, between scenarios. And I think we're between scenario protagonists and forecasters. And what Paul and I were trying to do in our comments were establish some of the boundaries. So I don't agree with you, Stefan, yeah. that scenarios are forecasts. They have a quite different purpose and a, t uh, a quite different uh, construction. They have forecasting implications and forecasting components. And that's my scenarios rant that'll do. <laughs> Thank you very I, much. I forecast, that, I forecast that, Robert, yes. Um. <laughs> We've got a couple of um, more questions coming in, so I'll keep on feeding them. A uh, question from James. Uh, what is more powerful in forecasting, data analytics or collective human judgment? Paul, I think this is one for you to start. Oh, with. right. Well, that, of course, <laughs> very much depends on the context. If you've got uh, lots of data with nice regular patterns, um, I'd put my money on uh, on data analysis because the data analysis models will filter out the randomness. The human judges will be deceived by that randomness, probably, and read false patterns into it. If, however, you've um, You've no data. You've no data. Perhaps in new product forecasting, you might have some market research results. I don't know. Um, or if there's a fundamental change in the underlying conditions, the underlying environment within which the forecasts are being made, um, I think that uh, judgment uh, would would probably have this subject subject to lots of cognitive and motivational biases not being present. That judgment, I think, there would have the edge. Um, but this is quite a big subject. It, it, it's it's a subject that's moved on over the, over the last twenty or thirty years. Mm -hmm. I think the accepted view, uh, perhaps thirty years ago, maybe even forty years ago, was that uh, judgment had no place in forecasting. That you should always rely on models. I think we're much more insightful now, and we do recognise that judgment can play a useful role as long as it is applied to forecasts appropriately. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I would definitely agree if I may uh, add a few yes. words to that, that it depends very much on the context. I come from retail forecasting where you have thousands of time series and uh, or tens or millions of, uh, of, of time series. A human can't cope with all of them. And when a human tries to forecast something, they'll invariably see 
patterns where none exist. And so I'm I'm very, very, very cynical, essentially, about human judgment in my particular field. I think that there are other fields where people can make more of a difference and uh, Petlock super forecasters come to mind. So there's one thing where you wouldn't even know how to start with a data driven approach. Uh, it really depends very much on where you are. Thank you. Uh, another question coming in. How do you go about proving to the business that forecasts are doing a good job when they may be taking strong action on the back of the forecast to avoid a bad outcome? But by doing this, the accuracy of the forecast looks rubbish. So any thoughts on that one? Perhaps I might uh, start yeah, please, for definitely. a change. All right, yeah, just, just a few days ago, I read a little uh, comment commentary paper by Rob Heintman. Uh, on a forthcoming in the International Journal of Forecasting, where I think it's on his, his website, uh, short PDF, very, very interesting. And there he discusses his work for the Australian government in forecasting COVID cases, which he's been involved with for the last two years, and I assume many forecasters as well. And of course, the, the point of these forecasts is to be as bad as possible, essentially telling people this is going to happen if you don't do anything. So better start doing something so the forecasts come out wrong. And that is exactly this kind of situation, right? We're forecasting a huge wave so people, all of Australia goes into a lockdown so the wave never appears. Uh, is the forecast therefore bad? I think the, the only way you can go about this is not, uh, not to look at the forecasts and the outcomes themselves, but to establish your expertise uh, in unrelatedly to the particular forecasting exercise that you're involved with. And of course, it helps that uh, Rob Heintman has been a forecasting expert for, the, for multiple decades before he started doing COVID forecasting. And he can point to a proven track record of knowing what he's doing. And, and of course, it's easy to explain that uh, there is a disconnect between the forecast and the actual outcome if you acted on the forecast. So uh, that helps in, in this year. But essentially, it's a question of building trust, of having people, having decision makers and the public and whoever is involved trust the forecaster. And you can't always do that based on the forecast where the trust is required. Yeah, yes, I think that um, it's probably easier said than done, but I mean, hopefully you could point out to the person, look, if you hadn't had this forecast, you wouldn't have changed your behaviour and you would have uh, suffered this disaster or this, this misfortune. Um, of course, e easy to say that, mm. harder to convince people, but that I think should be the principle. Okay, okay thank you. I've got another question coming in. Uh, this is from Leonidas and it's this. What is the uh, hold on, let me just get that. Yes, what is the best way to give the take this with a pinch of salt message to business users? Would you consider prediction intervals or cross validation results or maybe something else? What, what's your thoughts on that? The best way to give the take this with a pinch of salt message. I, I, is the question saying that, that we should always present forecasts with a pinch of salt? I, I'm not quite no, sure. No, I think I, I think it's just when you do need to, when when you know that there is a. Yes. I think I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, and Leonard's do come in if I'm misinterpreting it. I think he's saying, well, what if we know that the prediction intervals are quite wide and we know that the forecast is not terrifically accurate? How mm. do we best convey that? I think that's I think that's what uh, is being asked. Yes. Well, hopefully the prediction interval itself will convey that there's a large amount. If you're using point forecasts, at least the prediction interval will convey that there's a large amount of uncertainty possibly around that forecast. Mm -hmm. Whether people take that on board uh, is is another is another thing. Uh, if you feel that you're presenting a forecast which uh, should be taken with a pinch of salt, that I perhaps wouldn't present that forecast uh, in the first place. Uh, although if I'm a forecaster, I'm going to lose my job if I don't present forecasts. That might not uh, be quite so so easy. Um, Okay. I don't know All right. Thanks, Steph. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um. Uh, just, just a couple of comments on that. First of all, yes, I think we should all forecasts should come with the notion of uncertainty around the forecast. We should never give a simple point forecast. Uh, if the for prediction interval is small, then wonderful. And if it not, it, if it isn't, then we should communicate that. And I, might, I would always present a prediction interval. I struggle to to understand what, uh, how we would 
use cross-validation results to present the uncertainty of forecasts. Perhaps understand, I'm understanding it in, in the way that we do our, mm -hmm. we use a holdout sample and say, okay, our method would give a mean squared error or a MAPE or whatever uh, on the holdout sample. And uh, this error is large for this series and it's small for that series. So our uncertainty is larger for this series or for that series. If that's the notion of cross-validation used here, it's very, very, very hard for people to understand and interpret error measures. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would always go for prediction intervals. And prediction intervals are also easy to, to verify. And people can see how often our prediction intervals actually capture uh, the true outcome. So yeah. always go with those. Thank you. We have an additional comment from Robert here. We should not forget the consequences of Liz Trust refusing to ask for the OBR forecast of the effects of her mini budget. And she failed to forecast her political demise. There we are. Um, thank you, Robert, for that um, question from Radek. What is your definition of forecastable and non forecastable, especially in a retail or commercial environment? Where do you draw the line? Would you base that on zero demand points or maybe variability of history? What's your view on that? Uh, I think I'll take that one. I should sure. have an answer to that. Uh, I would say everything is forecastable. Uh, because uh, <laughs> I have to say that, right? It's part of my job description. Uh, you can. The problem always is how easy is it to forecast. But if you have a new product introduction in retail, then there is always something that is at least vaguely relatable. And the first mobile phones came out. Well, yeah, nobody had any idea about how many people would buy a phone, but you'd have an idea of how many people, how large is the target market? Uh, those are the times when there wouldn't be two or more phones per person. So how many people would buy a phone? So it at least get a uh, like a ballpark figure, essentially. Mm -hmm. You'd, it would might be off by a, an order of magnitude. Yeah, that is correct. Mm -hmm. So it would be a very imprecise forecast, but you can put a number down. You can say this is a reasonable forecast. Yeah. And so I think the question is not so much about forecastable or not forecastable, but is the forecast very useful or is it not? Or is one forecast more yeah. useful than the other? Because as I said, you always need to forecast. You always need to figure out what's going to happen in the future. Thank you. Well, I, I would think something like technology in 200 years time might be unforecastable. OK, you can make a forecast, but uh, I wouldn't give it any any credibility. <laughs> the good thing about forecasts 200 years hence is that we'll all be dead by the time they are proven it's, wrong. Un unless well, the age problem is solved, yeah. if the technology is available for keeping us alive for 200 years, yes. Yeah. Uh, my forecast is that that's going to take a long, long time to happen. <laughs> unfortunately. Okay, well, on, uh, on that cheerful note, uh, <laughs> no, I'd just like to thank um, both Paul and Stefan. I think it's been a fascinating discussion and um, a very rich topic, actually. Uh, and a good topic, I think, for us to to consider further. Thank you to everybody who joined us today and particularly to those people who put their questions up. I think I've gone through all the questions that were actually offered. Yeah, I think so. I don't think I've missed anything. So thanks again. Just to say before we finish that we are um, doing these um, sessions once a month and our next is planned for December the 16th. We're just uh, finalizing the speaker but we will announce that please look out on linkedin and other media and we'll let you know uh, who'll be speaking on december 16th and hope to see uh, many of you again so thanks again to uh, paul and stefan and to everybody who joined us bye bye for now bye thank you very much uh, it's been a pleasure thank you.